Hello, welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here and a return guest, but now has a new job. Mark Schofield has just joined SB Nation. And Mark, it's been really fun. It's like every time I have you on, you have a different job and you're always climbing up the ladder though. And you know, it's just been great to follow because I love your work. Your analysis of quarterbacks is top notch. Everybody knows that. Uh, and so I, I'm happy to see it. And thanks for taking the time to come on as you're adjusting to a new gig. Matthew, thank you for, for having me. It's always fun to come back. And yeah, it's it's been a fun little first week. Um, I'm now part of the corporate machine. Like we've got like meetings and, you know, things I got to take care of. And, you know, it's it's different, but it's been one heck of a journey. And, and to get here, um, it's kind of pretty cool. I will say that. I mean, I announced it on the eight year anniversary of the first piece I ever wrote in this space over at Inside the Pylon, uh, RIP ITP. Um, and so that was pretty cool, but excited to be back. We got week one in the books. Um, I have no idea what we're going to talk about. I can't imagine there's anything to talk about after the week that was in the NFL. But as always, buddy, it's it's great to be back with you. It's great to see you. And, and you're, you're such a dear friend. Um, and it's great to come on. I'm such a huge fan of everything that you do. Well, I really appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, inside the pylon from back in the day, uh, kind of, uh, you know, trailblazing. There's I mean, things going around on, on Twitter even right now about film analysis and stuff like that. And inside the pylon introduced me to a lot of football concepts. When I got the job covering the Vikings, I went Googling for everything I could learn about how football actually works. And inside the pylon really kind of guided me through that. So it's, it's very cool to see you go from there. And it's, it's amazing to see like the people that kind of went through ITP, like Matty Brown, who does a great job covering the Seahawks, Ted Wynn, obviously at the athletic Deontay Lee, at the athletic um john ledyard brandon thorne ethan young who's like chip kelly's right hand at ucla like the list goes on and i know i'm missing people dave archibald obviously he's such a driving force behind itp and remains a dear friend to this day like the names of people michael kist i mean chuck zada like so many great people um spent some time at itp and you know to see all the success that everybody has you know, gone on to in, in this space or other tangential football spaces. It's just, it's been the best part of it for me, like seeing other people go on to great things. So that, that's been awesome. No, it's very cool. And it's one of my favorite parts of this show is that, you know, people we have on like, um, you know, even, uh, you know, like Charles McDonald or Steven yep. Ruiz or yourself, like guys who started out in kind of unique spots in the space and then uh, built out really cool careers. So uh, anyway, you're the you're the quarterback guy. You are the go to yeah. quarterback. It's what you are. Man, it's what you do. Eagles fans aren't happy with me right now. What, uh, okay, well, let's begin right there. I want to know what you thought of Jalen Hurts' first performance because the Eagles' offense overall was very good. It's interesting. The, the big question, Matthew, facing Jalen Hurts this year: Can he perform the pirouette? You know balance an act that he needs to perform as an athletic quarterback because you watch him last year you watch him at oklahoma you watch him at alabama he's a tremendous athlete but for some athletic quarterbacks and he is certainly one balancing what he can create what he can do with his legs with the need to just sometimes stick in the pocket and make a throw and protect yourself as a quarterback it's a balancing act that he is going through and it's going to be a process. Last year, particularly early in the season, there were so many moments where you see him make his first read. And he's like, I don't like this. Pulls the ball down and runs. And then around, I, I, I keep bringing up the Denver game from last year. There was literally a play, Matthew, where he starts to bring the ball down. And it's like, here we go again. And then he's like, nope. And he resets himself and makes a throw. And I thought, okay, the light's coming on. Now he's sort of figured it out. Now fast forward to Sunday because – he ran it 17 times. He ran for like 90 yards. And a lot of Eagles, not just fans, but anal analysts, Benjamin Solak, who covers the Eagles, loves the Eagles. You know, he talked about it. Les Bowen wrote a piece about it yesterday that's like, this is not sustainable. He's still like got that desire in the back of his mind that the second he doesn't like something, he's going to bail the pocket. I watched that game and kind of had a different take on it. I thought there were some moments, and I highlighted in a piece I wrote at SB Nation, like three different plays where it's like you can see him get pressured and hand in there and make a throw where in last year, particularly early in the year, I thought that's a situation. That's a scenario where he gets one or two points of pressure in the pocket where he's like, I'm out of here. I'm going, I'm making something happen with my legs. And so I thought that there were signs of growth from him 
in that regard. Now, he's nowhere near where he needs to be, you know, but, you know, their Eagles fans are very divided on Jalen Hurts, like extremely divided. I know that's probably something you're a little bit familiar with, given Kirk Cousins, who I'm sure we'll talk about. But for some Eagles fans, it doesn't matter. Like what they saw Sunday, he cannot do. It's further signs that he's not going to get to where he needs to be. And then there's an underlying aspect to this, which is whether it's sustainable, like even if it's good or not, whether there's growth or not, can you win? Can you survive in the NFL today as a quarterback? If you're running it 17 times, you're exposing yourself to hits. And, you know, there was an interesting clip earlier during training camp from, I think Pat O'Hara, the Titans quarterbacks coach, talking about Malik Willis, another athletic quarterback. And he made the point that you have to make throws from the pocket because the second you get out, the rules change. The league doesn't protect you as much. And so that's the push and pull with Hurts right now. Can he sort of grow to where he needs to be or at least do it more so he protects himself? Or does he continue to bail from pockets, particularly when he shouldn't, expose himself to hits, and we're seeing Gardner Minshew by Halloween? Yeah, I think I mean that's the biggest issue is just staying healthy if you're doing that. Um I don't know that it's a massive concern for me from a winning football game standpoint. Now I think when you get to the playoffs and you're playing the best defenses in the league, that usually is where the running part of it sort of runs out, right? And even I think there's something to it with Lamar Jackson where it's like that offense does not have a great passing game, a lot of the amazing passing game concepts. So they rely on him doing a lot with his legs. And then when you get to the playoffs, I think that's much harder. But in a regular season, I think that you can make up for some shortcomings running the ball. And the thing about like, not it is an efficient play to run the ball for the quarterback a lot of times, right? You're not throwing interceptions. You're not taking sacks. You're making positive plays. And then a lot of times what you see is, oh, it's third and seven. And they dropped everybody back in coverage. But whoop, there's your quarterback running for a first down. Like, I think it's a huge edge. And even if he leans a little bit too far toward it, I think it's still very hard to defend for most defenses. And the other thing is, is I, I feel like I am a pretty big Jalen Hurts defender uh, in, in part because I don't think he throws the ball badly. Like, I don't think he's, I don't think he's Vince Young where you're like, right. uh, this guy better run all the time because half his throws are going into the dirt. Like, I think he is very capable of throwing the ball and improving in this area as he goes along. Yeah, and you bring up a very important point, Matthew, which is kind of the landscape of the NFL right now. We live it in this drop seven, drop eight, cover two quarters world where defenses are basically showing offenses light boxes and saying, look, we know that passing is more efficient than running. Like We know that. I mean, Huddle 21 Clinic, Chris Vassour, Kyle Kogan, like all these high school coaches did a great presentation on how at the high school level they're showing light boxes because they're daring high school quarterbacks to run the ball because they don't want them throwing the ball. It's the same thing we're seeing at the NFL as stuff always sort of trickles up. The way you change that to your advantage is sometimes not just by running the football and sort of taking the bait, but you want to really get a numbers advantage as an offense, run it with your quarterback. You know, because now if you've got, you know, five in the box and they're trying to account for all the gaps and you run it with your quarterback, you really flip the numbers advantage in your favor. And I think that certainly is an efficient weapon for offenses in today's NFL. Like, look at Josh Allen and the Bills. I mean, they had almost no running game last year, except for Josh Allen sometimes running with his legs. I think the Eagles can do that with Hurt. So I think it's certainly a, a winning recipe, at least formulaically right now. Of course, there's the injury factor and Hurts and other athletic quarterbacks. You know, Jackson does a great job at sort of protecting himself. Like there are moments when, you know, Lamar can try a move in the open field to get more yards, but he'll just dip out of bounds. He'll slide. He'll protect himself. Hurts, Allen, some of these other guys. I mean, even Geno Smith on Monday night, like lowering the shoulder into defenders in the open field as a quarterback. Maybe not the move to make, but, you know, you like it when you see it, you sort of you know, respect it. But if you want to play all 17 games, you probably shouldn't do that. But I think the landscape of the NFL and the way the game is played right now, particularly with with what defenses are showing offenses, running the quarterback is a big advantage. And uh, I just checked it. Jalen Hurts had the highest EPA running for week one. So not, not a surprise that like right. it, it did make a legitimate impact. Uh, so I understand the criticism, but I also think that if you're a defense, I mean, last year, I, uh, you know, Kyler Murray against the Vikings, Kyler Murray kind of played a very up and down game. He had a couple of bad interceptions in that game, but where did he get bailed out the most? 
Daniil Hunter is running at him free and he ran away. <laughs> like that's, yeah. and that's another part of it too. So it's like pocket quarterbacks. I don't know that they're that much healthier because they're a sitting duck a lot of times. Now Kirk cousins is great at this and staying healthy, but I don't know that all of them are standing in the pocket and just knowing exactly where the werewolf defensive ends are coming to eat them. Right. So there's, right. there is a lot of, there is a lot of give and take. I, I guess I always just want to kind of lean toward defending the running quarterback in part um, with Jalen Hurts too. I, w- I wonder what you think of this. Adding AJ Brown is awesome for him to have a receiver who's going to be open and catches the football. Uh, last year, you know, after you got past Devontae Smith and Dallas Goddard, it was like, whom plays for this team? Right, um, right. But but now, you know, you have your your multiple weapons. But I also think it draws a lot of attention there as well. So if you're looking at AJ Brown as your first read and he's double covered, well, that's two guys who aren't anywhere near you as the quarterback. Like I, I think that adding AJ Brown has ancillary benefits beyond just being AJ Brown. There, there's a massive Matthew sort of butterfly ancillary effect of the Brown acquisition, which is why I think it was brilliant for the Eagles. And what is certainly, you know, the the coverage attention that he's going to draw. I always love getting into the mind of like an opposing offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, when you're thinking about things like this, you know, if you're, you know, the Vikings this week, you're the defensive staff and you're thinking, all right, who are we going to rotate coverage towards? Who might we bracket or put up a two double on? It's AJ Brown. Like, like that's the answer there. And so, you know, that's what it's going to be week in and week out. He's going to draw attention. And so it's going to take perhaps one defender away from getting after Hertz. And the other sort of big benefit is, and I know he didn't have a, didn't put up numbers against the Lions, but for Devonta Smith, you know, had a good rookie year as a wide receiver, but we all know the sort of criticisms of him or at least concerns about him size. Can he beat press aligned defenders and physical corners in the NFL? And last year there were moments when bigger, more physical corners were able to pin him to the boundary. But now with Brown, although the Eagles sort of used Brown off the ball a lot, you can put him in the on-ball role that's sort of prototypical X receiver to draw press coverage and move Smith around and get him some free releases, get him some favorable matchups. And so that's another sort of ancillary effect, what it's going to mean for the other receivers on the team in addition to what it means for Hertz. And the final thing is Hertz thrown over the middle. Another big sort of concern about his game that Eagles fans have, and it's an understandable one, a perfectly valid one. Brown does some of his best work over the middle, like fearless, no qualms about protecting himself. Like if you want to throw him a dig route in the teeth of cover two, and he knows he's going to get hit by one of the safeties, both of the safeties, the drop in linebacker, people on the sidelines, like he does not care. That's going to help Hertz attack in the middle of the field. Because as we saw Monday night with Russell Wilson, he's not – comfortable attack in the middle of the field sometimes when defenses know we don't have to worry about like the outside or we don't have to worry about the middle of the field between the hashes the numbers that makes their jobs easier having brown will help hurts in that effect as well and and i look at the way and i know it's against the lions and they have not restored the defensive roar but uh the offensive line for the Eagles, I, I think, is in a much better place than what the Vikings faced in week one. The Vikings yeah. faced a team in week one that was lacking its two best players on the offensive line, and that really showed. I mean, Dalvin Tomlinson had a big game for them, Zadarius Smith, Daniel Hunter. But, you know, you look at this offensive line now and the fact that they added Landon Dickerson to this, uh, you know, and, and he's developed and, and Jason Kelsey's one of the best players in the league. Lane Johnson is one of the best players in the league. And I even go back and I don't mean to rip old uh, wounds open for the Vikings fans. But in 2017, that NFC championship, uh, a lot of people walked out of that and said, man, Mike Zimmer's defense just got schemed like uh, maybe, you know, Zimmer, Zimmer couldn't get it done in the biggest moment. And I remember reviewing that game and being like, oh, when the offensive line blocks all four guys and you get no pressure on any quarterback in the NFL, the dude can deliver passes with five seconds to throw. And I think of this with Hurts where it's like, we kind of talk about this with Kirk's contract all the time. Jalen Hurts being on a rookie deal and the talent that they've been able to put around him, like the shortcomings that everyone's going to talk about with Jalen Hurts just all matter less when you can put this offensive line these weapons make a trade for AJ Brown. I think he has one of the best situations in the entire NFL to work with. He absolutely might Matthew. Let's not forget. You're talking to somebody who 
you know, after that NFC Championship game, then had to watch his Patriots get decimated by the, that same 2017. Team. I know exactly what you're talking about. That started the whole, are the Patriots athletic enough on defense? So they have pass rushes, they have linebackers. Like, no, that offensive line kind of kicked their butts up and down the field. Like, that's what happened. Um, but you're right about the situation that Hurts finds himself in because this is the sort of prototype, right? Like, this is the model, like, almost to a T, the Russell Smith and Seattle model, which sort of started the whole conversation about quarterbacks on their rookie deals, build around them. If you get, you know, Wilson was a, you know, third round pick, Hertz was a second round pick. Like you get those guys in the later rounds that they're not on that big money deal. You can acquire an AJ Brown. You can put together this offensive line around them. You can right before the season starts trade for Chauncey Gardner Johnson and add yet another piece. You could add a James Bradbury. Like you can just build and build and build around that player and hope that either he gets there to where, yeah, he's worth the long-term extension or he's at least good enough where you can win. And like you said, the pieces that you've added minimize the shortcomings and deficiencies in areas where he needs to improve and grow as a quarterback. Howie Roseman has done a tremendous job. And you know, I remember sitting, standing like eight, 10 feet in front of him at the podium at the combine, you know, last combine where he said, we're in a very good position because we have draft capital and we have cap space. And those teams that have those two things are able to be aggressive. And so we're going to be as aggressive as we can to build around Jalen Hurts. Both he and Sirianni said that in lockstep. Of course, it came out that at night they were trying to trade for Russell Wilson. But still, they had the cap space. They had the draft capital to be aggressive. They've done that. They've put this all around Hurts. And now it's up to see, you know, does he get there where he needs to be? Or is he still at least good enough that, all this talent has made it a winnable recipe. So my question is, as far as this matchup goes with the Vikings, I mean, how tough is it? Because I look at Philadelphia, especially since Dallas is uh, now in a lot of trouble and Washington, mm, we've seen, we've seen some decent Carson Wentz performances before that uh, do not sustain over a full season. Right. And uh, I'm not, I'm not ready to uh, shave my head for Brian Dable yet or whatever, but um so I, I think that Philadelphia is the strongest team in that division, but how good are they actually? And, and does that really rest on the shoulders of how good Jalen Hurts plays? I think in part, you know, this is a quarterback driven league. So in part, in large part, perhaps it rests on Jalen Hurts. But I think, look, Jonathan Gannon is also under a microscope. I mean, you talk about putting people in positions to be successful. Look at what they added on defense, right? Like you, you add, obviously, Jordan Davis in the first round, a tremendous draft pick. You add Bradbury. You add Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. You add Hassan Reddick. Like, they have put talent on the defensive side of the ball as well. And last year it was they're playing all these soft coverages. They don't want to give up huge plays. Like, they can't get home. They don't want to blitz because they're afraid about the linebackers and the guys they have in the secondary. Those arguments are all out the window now. Like, you look at the talent they have. Kazir White, the linebacker that they added, like a, a, an athletic component to that second level that they've been missing for a long time. And yet you see the Lions have the success that they did. You see the Lions, particularly when they took Jordan Davis off the field, have success running the football. And so now there's a lot of sort of angst about that defensive performance. And is Gannon going to be able to adjust what he has done in the past, given the talent that he has, or are they going to continue to play like this and give up plays, give up yards? And so, you know, I think Gannon's under a lot of a, a little to a lot of pressure with how he uses these pieces that they've added on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of Washington last year where everyone expected their defense to be amazing because of the talent and then their scheme was bad and it just didn't really matter. And and I, I wonder like how much of that just is starting to apply in the NFL. Like, obviously, you know, you can go back to Dick LeBeau or whatever, like scheme matters for defense, Bill Parcells and all that. And uh, it's always going to be the players who are most important, but I feel like uh, defensive play calling, defensive scheme, how you teach these things uh, with so many complicated route combinations, motions, everything that, that t offenses are trying to do, it just becomes more and more and more, important and i feel like last year i felt like like what are they doing if i can recognize everything they're doing on tape then it's like okay it's not enough if it looks like that madden cover two play that i use every single time it's just not enough and uh this is where i think that the vikings have the biggest advantage in the game i think that the offense for 
um, you know, the Eagles is going to score some points. But it feels like, what are you guys going to do? Because if you don't confuse Kirk Cousins, he annihilates you. And you saw it last week. You saw it many times against the Patricia Lions that just wanted to play the very basic coverage. I think he's going to do it again against Philadelphia. Yeah, and, you know, he, you talk about sort of the, like the schemes. Like, everybody knows what everybody's doing. Like, what you really sort of make your mark as an offensive play designer is – how well you break coverage rules and you know kevin o'connell did a fantastic job of that like you know just an easy quick example like quarters you know four deep or whatever you know the safety will take the inside number two receiver if he's vertical well what does that mean some teams teach five steps from that receiver some teams seven yards ten yards whatever it is you have to have route combinations that will break that. Like if you're running post out a nice sort of quarters cover four beater where outside guy runs a post, inside guy runs an out route, you want the safety to read that inside guy number two as a vertical threat. So if you're having him run a two-yard out route, he's I don't need that. Then the post guy runs right into the safety. You're not breaking the rules. And so you've got to find ways to break those rules. You've got to find ways to confuse not just quarterbacks, because if you, you know, you look at play designs, you look at playbooks, routes will convert based on coverage, right? So if you're middle field open versus middle field close, like you might run a different route depending on what happens there. You rotate the coverage, you spin the safeties, you try to confuse the quarterback. You might not confuse him, but you might confuse the receiver. And suddenly the receiver's not where the quarterback expects him to be. If you look back at Brady's first couple of weeks with the Buccaneers, you saw some interceptions where it's like, what is happening here? And that's what was happening. They were confusing not just the quarterback, but the receiver as well, or at least getting one of those guys on a different page. That's what you have to do to teams these days. That's what you have to do to offenses. Try to confuse somebody on the other side of the ball. And if you're just as Coach Bass loves to say, you know, drop it into, you know, country cover three or whatever, that's not going to work. Like teams, quarterbacks, everybody's going to be able to figure that out. But if you're making it confusing or at least making them take a half second or so to read something out, throw time it off, that's where you're going to have success. Yeah. And I remember PFF studied this, like how the coverage looked different than what it was supposed to be based on the alignment and how quarterbacks reacted. Like no surprise, Allen and Mahomes, like they still had great EPAs, but Kirk was one of the ones that dropped quite a bit. And that's no surprise because he has to read, react from the pocket, make a throw. He's not going to just run all over the place. Uh, and then, you know, find somebody open. And and I think that if you if Philadelphia doesn't do that, it's like been one of the best indicators of how Kirk is going to play is how much does that team change up its coverages after the snap? And then, as always, does the defensive line get after Kirk Cousins, which right. I think is 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 always the kryptonite uh, and could always be an issue. But I, I wonder about uh, I wrote about this at the website, sustainability of what they did on Sunday against the Packers, because this was not Kirk Cousins first big game. I mean, right. he has shredded many an opponent, but it's always been the over a 17 game schedule where you have the Kirk coaster. But I saw some things that I think on tape when I watched it back uh, yesterday that were what I would refer to as maybe like easy buckets for Kirk Cousins, a clear out route from Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson runs underneath and catches an eight yard pass or something like that. Like things like that. I think a lot of times the previous offense, the wide zone, the boots, they were just always going for broke, like always looking for those big plays and sometimes maybe forgot to like, just get Kirk a completion and get him comfortable back there. Yeah. And you know, that's important for a quarterback, you know, cousins or otherwise like to sometimes give you that layup, give you that throw, get you in a rhythm, you know, and it also, it's a way of giving the defense something else to think about. Like some of those outside zone, wide zone boot designs, like it's, you're trying to get that three level stretch. You're trying to get that shot over the top, but the intermediate out route is often wide open. And sometimes it's okay to just take that. And if you're dialing those concepts up, you have to have a willingness to hit that throw and an ability to hit that throw. Same thing on that sort of like two man flood, where you've got the clear out in the out route where you get somebody running it off and Jefferson running that out. You know, that's a nice throw to take, too. I think the question of sustainability might get more to the will Justin Jefferson be left wide open as he was on Sunday? I mean, as somebody that loved Justin coming out, like, you know, I, I the production was huge. He's a fantastic route runner. We've all seen the clip of him against Jair Alexander on that dig route. Um, but the Packers at times sort of left him 
wide open. But that gets to the coverage rules part of it. When you know, look, they're going to be in this coverage or we expect them to be in this coverage based on what we're going to do formationally or, or personnel wise. This is the route that's going to sort of break that coverage rule. You know, that's a great job by Kevin O'Connell. And I think, you know, we sometimes say, oh, guys running wide open. It's all about the defense. There's miscommunication. And sometimes there is that. Sometimes there is that based on what the offensive play caller and play designer did. And so I think that's important, too. If you can get Justin Jefferson running wide open for the next 17 games, next 17 weeks, I think you're going to have a good season, Matthew. <laughs> Hot take. Yeah, is that, is that a spicy <laughs> one for this Wednesday morning? If the number one receiver is wide open, they will be yeah. good. Uh, but no, I think I do think that that's something that um, you know they they can continue to do even better than the previous coaching staff did. Not that the previous coaching staff struggled to get Jefferson open; he had the most yards in the league for the first two years of his career. So, yeah. um, you know, but uh, it looked to me like, uh, yeah, they understood a lot of ways that. Uh, the Packers were going to try to cover them and even putting like Thielen and Jefferson on one side of the field in a running back tight end and number three receiver on the other side of the field. And it was like, wait, sh our nickel corner should go to the strong side, but those two good players are to the weak side. And then the Packers yeah. were just looking at each other. Like, I don't know. I'm Quay Walker. What am I supposed to do here? Right. Um, so it was, uh, it was really impressive to see, but now there'll be adjustments. Um, before we wrap up, I want to ask you this. So uh, we spend 230 days from the Super Bowl to week one making opinions and uh, yep. predictions and all those things. And then after one week, they're all blown to heck. Oh, so yeah. I want to know, <laughs> I want to know which ones of your opinions do you feel great about still offseason opinions after week one and which ones may have been blown up? Yeah, I mean, the one I still feel good about is that Detroit, when we get to you know, post Thanksgiving, holiday season, December, and all the networks before the games, they have the playoff picture graphic, right? I've been saying all summer that when we start seeing those, Detroit will still be listed at the bottom as in the hunt. Like they might not ultimately get in, but Lions fans will have reasons to tune in come December beyond, are we going to get the first overall pick for the first time in a long time? And I still feel good about that despite the loss to Philadelphia. Like, I still think this is a team that's going to get some wins along the way. They might get one with Washington this week to get to one and one. Um, I, I still feel that they're going to be in the playoff mix. So I still feel good about that one. You know, one that I don't feel as good about was that, you know, I, I think after what we saw Sunday, I'm not so sure Indianapolis is going to have this sort of easy path to the division title that we thought. I mean, I would have expected more against Houston. Now, I think that speaks to, you know, Houston might be a little bit better than we thought. Uh, but I really thought that, look, Indianapolis was set up. We were hearing all training camp that like, oh, it's a new sort of feel around the locker room with Matt Ryan. It's night and day. And of course, that might have more to do with Carson Wentz than anything else. But there are all these great thoughts about how Indianapolis was going to be in a much better position. And then they go out and they tie. Like, like yeah, feel a little queasy about that one. And so... You know, maybe it was just a week one sort of mirage, but I'm a little worried about the Colts right now. Uh, I kind of expected Aaron Rodgers to just make Romeo dubs the next great wide receiver. And now I'm not convinced that's going to happen. I also, and, and I'm not like, it, this is like just week one reaction. It's not like saying this won't happen, but I kind of expect Trevor Lawrence to be great by the end of the season. And I'm not so sure he was great. And yeah. it's like, is that going to happen or is that not going to happen? As somebody that's still sort of on the Trevor bandwagon here, not getting the warm and fuzzies after we watching that game. Like, I still think he's tremendously talented. And I still have faith that the, and I still believe that, like, yeah, he's going to be the guy by the end of the season. But would have thought it would have gotten off to a bit better of a start. Uh, at Mark Schofield on Twitter, SB Nation NFL writer now, and uh, a great pal. So I appreciate you taking the time here, despite the fact you have SB Nation meetings and uh, plenty, plenty to write about to preview week two. So you're the best man. Always tremendous insight and analysis and uh, great to catch up with you again. Always a blast, Matthew. Love it every time, man. Appreciate you, buddy.